Good afternoon, everybody. So I have a couple of random tangent thoughts, and then we'll, we'll dive into the message for today. So random tangent thought number one is that I am reminded of Father Andrew Apostoli. He's one of the founders of our community. He was a pretty stable presence here at the Blue Army Shrine. If, if you've been coming for a while, you may remember him. Uh, he since passed on to be with the Lord. But he talked about having to speak one time uh, for Father Benedict because Father Benedict had gotten ill or something. And so he would always say this, so I'm going to steal his line. You have the who's who, like Father Jerry Murray, and you have the who's that. So for those of you who came to hear him speak, I'm the who's that. My name is Brother Pius. I'm one of the chaplains here. I've been with the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal for 18 years, so almost 20 years. Uh, I joined in 2006, uh, right after I graduated from Franciscan University of Steubenville. Um, and I've been assigned all over the place in the New York area, also in New Mexico. Uh, our community, if you're not familiar with us, typically we live in very poor neighborhoods and we're dedicated to serving the poor, hands-on work with the materially poor, and also preaching the gospel, so the new evangelization. Those are sort of the two pillars of our community's life. Um, obviously, out here, we're more concerned about the deer than we are about the gang members, um, although it seems like the deer may have their own type of violence, running into people's cars and all the things that the deer do. Um, so the second random tangent has to do with my friend St. Anthony here. So St. Anthony was from Portugal, and it's actually his feast day today, St. Anthony. So, um, so it's interesting, and there's a story related to the Fatima children about St. Anthony. But you may or may not know that St. Anthony had been an Augustinian monk before he became a Franciscan. And he saw the martyrs, the first Franciscan martyrs, leave for Morocco, and then he saw their bodies come back. And he was so inspired by their zeal that he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the Augustinians. He was a super well-educated guy, and he went off to join the Franciscans, and nobody knew who he was. So they assigned him to go to this little town called Forli in Italy, and he was supposed to teach scripture to some of the brothers and be a hermit. And I actually, when I was in college, I got to go to Forli and pray in the cave where he lived uh, in Italy. It was, it was incredible. And what happened was one day, so the Dominicans usually preach on the Feast of St. Francis, and the Franciscans preach on the Feast of St. Dominic. And this is back in the day when the universities were a big deal, and, you know, these big-time preachers would come, and they'd pack these churches, and the priest who was supposed to give the homily for the, for the Franciscans and the Dominicans, they both got sick. And so they said, we need a preacher. Who's going to preach? And they basically told St. Anthony he had to preach under holy obedience, and he preached, and everybody realized what an amazing preacher he was, and that basically launched him into becoming, well, eventually a doctor of the church. So I feel a little bit of consolation to have his statue next to me since I literally woke up this morning thinking Father Jerry Murray was going to be here and was told last minute, Brother Pius, we need you, we need you to give the talk. So if it's terrible, hey, I only had a day to prepare. If it's wonderful, thank the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's my tangent. If you lose anything, today is the day. It's an act of hope. You're clapping already. Wonderful. Um, if you lose anything today, know that St. Anthony stole it so that he would get your prayers. So make sure. Um, actually, one last thing about St. Anthony. St. Anthony, yeah, he's the patron of finding your keys. Like, how many of us have a story? Don't, you don't have to raise your hands because everyone would raise their hands here, right? You lost your keys, you prayed to St. Anthony, and you found them in the fridge. What were they doing there? I don't know. So St. Anthony, though, he's actually known for being a powerful finder of lost souls. He's the guy that you pray to when somebody in your family is far away from the Lord and they need to be found by the Good Shepherd. That's St. That's Anthony's actual reputation. He brought back so many people from the ways of error. He brought them back home to the church. That's St. Anthony's real 
powerhouse work. And so if you have anybody in your family, and you don't have to raise your hands, probably even more of you have people in your family who are far away from the Lord. So pray to St. Anthony to find them and have themselves be found by the Good Shepherd. What does this have to do with Fatima, you ask? You know, I get a commission for all of the times I mention Fatima. So if I just keep saying Fatima every time, it's like a $5 bill. Just kidding. I have a vow of poverty. I don't get anything. Um, um, no, but this was the day of the second apparition of Our Lady at Fatima. And the thing is, in Fatima, the Feast of St. Anthony was the biggest celebration day for the town because St. Anthony is one of the patrons of Portugal. So they said, if these kids are making this up, they're not going to skip the festivities, the candy, the delicious food, the processions, the music, the dancing, all of it. They're definitely not going to miss it because why would they miss it for some story? You know, kids, if you tell them you're going to give them ice cream, they'll do anything you want. And they missed the Feast of St. Anthony. And they went to the Cova di Iria. And what did Our Lady say? Good question. I happen to have this book here that tells me what Our Lady said. Um, so, the Blessed Mother, she comes, and Lucia says to her, what do you want of me? And Our Lady said, I wish you to come here on the 13th of next month to pray the rosary every day. And then she tells her, you need to learn to read, and later I'll tell you more of what I want. She asked for somebody to be cured, and the Blessed Mother said that the person, if they're converted, they'll be healed by the end of the year. And then she said, this is very beautiful, she said, I would like to ask you to take us to heaven. Kids, are, they're already thinking about heaven. How beautiful. And she says, yes, I will take Jacinta and Francisco soon. You are to stay here for some time longer. Jesus wants to use you to make me known and loved. He wants to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart, to those who accept this. I promise them the salvation of their souls, and they will be loved by God like flowers placed by me to adorn his throne. And then Lucia says this, Am I to stay here alone? I asked sadly. No, my daughter. Are you, are you suffering a great deal? Don't lose heart. I will never forsake you. My immaculate heart will be your refuge and the way that will lead you to God. At the moment when she spoke these last words, she opened her hands for the second time. She communicated to us the rays of that same immense light. And she says in a, in a previous apparition, she says, the light which is God. Mary is glowing with God's light like Jesus at Mount Tabor. We saw ourselves in this light as it were, immersed in God. Jacinto and Francisco seemed to be in that part of the light which rose towards heaven, and I in that which was poured out on the earth. In the front palm of Our Lady's right hand was a heart encircled by thorns which pierced it. We understood that this was the immaculate heart of Mary, outraged by the sins of humanity and seeking reparation. Beautiful, beautiful. What does God have for us in that message? I think a couple of points. First, when we're given a mission by God, it can feel lonely, can't it? I don't know about you, but it seems as though our world is getting more and more hostile to the values of the gospel. Things like abortion are rampant, violence, hatred, even within the church, there's terrible division. And poor Lucia, she's afraid to be alone. Why? Because she saw something that only her little cousins saw. And so she knew if the Blessed Mother takes them to heaven, I'm going to be stuck here. It's interesting that Our Lady's version of a little while longer, you know, Lucia is very young. She's like 10 or 11 years old, right? 
She lived till she was 90, so that's a little while to the Blessed Mother. So if God has told you to wait a little while for something, unless you're 90, you can keep hoping. It's okay. Even if you're 90, keep hoping. God never disappoints us. But that loneliness. You know, I'm graduating shortly with my degree in counseling, and I've studied a lot of psychology over the last few years. And one of the things that I've learned that I think is so beautiful and so important for us is to realize that fundamentally, our need for connection, our need for love, acceptance, it's one of the most fundamental needs that we have as human beings. When we're babies, one of the ways that God designed us is to be completely dependent on our parents. If you look at most other animals in nature, right? Like you look at a baby deer. The baby deer doesn't get carried by the mama deer for however many months until it learns how to walk. On the day a calf or a baby deer is born, they stand up and they start walking because if they don't, what's going to happen? Well, if a wolf comes or something, they're going to get eaten. Baby humans are oddly born underdeveloped and totally reliant on their parents. And it's that need for connection that we have from the first moment of our conception. Like, think about it. You're actually physically connected to your mother for nine months in her womb. And then for however many months afterwards, you're nursing. You rely on your mother, on this proximity of the mother's love for you, of your father's love for you, of their care for you. And so connection is built into us to experience the love and acceptance of our parents, to experience connectedness, right? The beautiful moment when you smile at the baby and the first time the baby smiles back. Right? And it's not just that they have a dirty diaper, which often is the case, right? And our Blessed Mother, in the order of grace, is a merciful mother to us. She promises Lucia and she promises us that we're not going to be alone, that she's going to be with us always, like her son Jesus promised. There's something beautiful and sorrowful about the Immaculate Heart, isn't there? Since that prophecy of Simeon, where he said that her heart would be pierced by a sword. And if you look at Our Lady's Immaculate Heart, you see those thorns and you see the sword piercing her heart. And you know, her heart is like her son's heart. Both of these hearts are pierced. Jesus' sword pierced by a lance, Our Lady's sword pierced by the sorrow, the seven sorrows, you know, that we pray, pierced by the sorrows. But there's something wonderful about the pierced heart of Our Lady. That heart is now opened up and becomes our refuge, our way to God. When I saw that word today, when I revisited Our Lady's message for today, she said, my heart will be your refuge. What's a refuge? Well, I looked it up in the dictionary. A refuge is a place of security, of safety, of protection, of peace. The world is a scary place. You know, I'd be lying to you if I said everything's going to be all right. We don't know if everything's going to be all right. There were periods in history where World War II happened, where World War I happened, where all sorts of terrible things have happened on our earth, 9-11 more recently. I can't promise you that everything's going to be without suffering. You know, the Blessed Mother said to St. Bernadette, she said, I can't promise you that you'll be happy in this life, but I promise you that you'll be happy in the next. Even though Lucia had to suffer waiting 
a little while longer, you know, some 80 years longer. Seemed like forever, I'm sure. She had a promise from the mother of God herself that she would be taken to heaven. Right? I mean, if you knew, it's in the bag, I'm going to heaven. What freedom, what joy you would have, huh? If you knew that whatever you're suffering, at the end, it would all be worth it. If you knew that with total confidence, how would you live? You know, it's interesting. There's a, a thing that we do in psychology, and it's called the miracle question. If a miracle happened and all your problems went away, how would you know that the miracle happened? Well, guess what? The miracle has already happened. I would point to the crucifix, but it's getting repaired right now. But the miracle has already happened. Jesus has already won our salvation. The Blessed Mother promises us, if we pray the rosary every day and we wear the scapular, she says, for those who keep the five first Saturdays and have devotion to my Immaculate Heart, what did she say to Lucia? I will save them. I promise them salvation. This isn't a license to sin, sort of like James Bond's license to kill. You do not have a license to sin, okay? But you do have confidence in the salvation from Jesus, in that love that is stronger than death, the love of Jesus that we just celebrated not too long ago in the Paschal Mystery. Jesus has saved us. All we have to do is say yes. All we have to do is go to confession, pray the rosary, receive the blessed sacrament. The Eucharist is the pledge of eternal salvation. It's a down payment on the life of God in our souls. And the Blessed Mother promises us that her heart will be our refuge. We can take refuge in the shadow of that mantle. We can enter into her wounded heart. And somehow, just like Jesus, she makes herself a beggar for our affection, for our reparation. Think about it. All the terrible things that people have done that wound and offend Our Lady's heart. She asks you and she asks me to help remove the thorns from her heart. I want you to think about when you were a little child. Did any of you ever do this thing? You know, my mom is probably watching this right now, and she knows that I would do this pretty regularly. But as a little kid, you go out into the yard, right? And you see dandelions everywhere. Or those little white clover flowers, right? And I remember I would go and I would pick the dandelions for my mom. I mean, little did I know at the time that dandelions are weeds, you know, and my dad would probably be very happy if I would rip up all of them for him. It would save him some work in the yard. And you give those flowers to your mom, huh? And those flowers, right, they're not super expensive or valuable. They're not some rare black orchid that requires years of cultivation before it blooms once in its lifetime, right? You know, or those uh, Christmas cactuses that, that bloom only at Christmas time. They're not like that. You literally don't have to do anything. In fact, most landscapers would tell you they're a pain in the butt. <laughs> they make the lawns look terrible. But your mom, to your mom, they're a sign of love, aren't they? They're a sign of your affection because you're a little child and you can't afford the rare black orchid or a bouquet of roses. You can't afford anything. You're a child. What do you have? You have the love in your heart. And the Blessed Mother, whose heart is so offended by the blasphemies against her, she lets us bring her dandelions and allows her heart to be consoled so that we little flowers, like she said, can be around her as the flowers that adorn her altar.
for the glory of God. Our lives become the bouquet of flowers that we offer to Our Lady. Do you have to do big, crazy, fancy things for God? No. What does she tell the children? Anything can be offered as a sacrifice of reparation. So my encouragement to you, brothers and sisters, is to look on that heart, that immaculate and sorrowful heart of our Blessed Mother, that heart that is pierced by the wounds and offenses of our sins. Go to that heart and offer her your dandelions. Whether your dandelions are a physical illness that you're dealing with, or your wife burned the chicken again, and you're going to eat it anyway. You know, whether it's something grandiose like being a missionary in a foreign country. I was just talking to one of the priests downstairs here in confessions, and he was in Kenya. Whether you do that, or you come here to the shrine, and you pick up a tissue on the ground and throw it away for us. Thank you if you do that, by the way. Whatever you do, if you do it with the intention of making reparation to that heart, if you receive communion today and say, Jesus, I adore you in the blessed sacrament. I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. And I pray for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love you. And I offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in reparation for the outrages committed against the immaculate and sacred hearts. If you make that prayer with that intention, whatever you do, Our Lady will take. I'll conclude with a story that Father Don Haggerty told our community once about Mother Teresa, who I feel privileged to share this ambo with. She actually preached here, right here. I'm touching a relic of Mother Teresa. Pretty amazing. A little child came in while he was speaking with her. He and another, I think like a bishop. And one of the sisters said, there's a child here with a donation for you, Mother. This is in India. And she said, oh, bring the child in. And the child came. Do you know what the child offered? A pile of rags that he had gathered for Mother Teresa and her sisters. And he said, Mother, I gathered these rags for you. And what did Mother Teresa do? Did she say, oh, great, thanks for the rags. Put them over in the corner. No. She took each rag, each one, and she said, I know just what to do with this. We needed a new rag to polish all of the candlesticks. Oh, and this one, this is perfect for the kitchen. She found a use for every one of those rags. Now, Mother Teresa is not Our Lady, but she's a heck of a lot closer than pretty much anyone else I've ever known. And I imagine that Our Lady looks at our little offerings in the same way. Oh, you stubbed your toe? I can use that for this person. Oh, you forgot this? I can use it for this person. The Blessed Mother wants to make use of everything. Like Jesus at the multiplication of the loaves, he says, gather all the fragments so that nothing is wasted. Brothers and sisters, gather the fragments. Let nothing be wasted. Our Lady's heart is so offended. And she's waiting for you for your dandelions. Will you bring them to her? Will you make that offering? Let's make the effort to give her our little yes, to help our brothers and sisters who are so far away, to help St. Anthony on his mission of finding lost souls. Lost souls are much more valuable than the keys to your Lexus, I promise you. And for you, who do this, Our Lady promises that you will be like beautiful flowers that adorn her altar, a unique flower that's never existed and will never exist again. She's waiting for you, but she can't do it without you. So let's make the effort today. Let's be like little children and give Our Lady our dandelions. I'm sure she'll be pleased. Won't it be beautiful to see her smile at the end of time? <laughs>